Good morning, good people of UPPC. Welcome. My name is Martha Green. I'm one of the pastors here. Ah, and what a morning, what a morning. Did you wake up and think you were in London this morning? Yeah, I did. And uh, on I-5, there's about... uh, There's about 400 feet of visibility. You can't even see the signs. I don't know what the pilots are doing this morning. But anyway, uh, welcome to those of you who sort of made your way through the fog to be here today. And welcome to those of you who are online today. I want to give a special welcome to those of you who are online. There's a very wonderful scripture found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, and it says this, let us not give up assembling together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And that word in Greek, give up, is really abandon, let us not abandon assembling together. And I just want to say, we know that you're online because you need to be, and and we want to affirm that we know you are really with us, that you have not abandoned worship, that you are very much with us, and we are perhaps not together in a building, but we are together oneness in the Spirit, and so may you be blessed by being with us here today. We also know that online worship is a supplement to our worship here in the sanctuary. We all look forward to the time when those who are able are able to be back in worship with us. Uh, I want to tell you that Pastor Mike has a very thoughtful sermon for us today on the topic of despair. Now, don't panic. And don't tune out or turn off or head for the exits. Yeah, because frankly, I cannot think of a better topic right now during this Omicron wave uh, than to look at how we can joyfully uh, trust in God during this time. And I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of COVID. And I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. How about you? Yeah. So let us uh, join together, stand if you're able, and sing with the saints from all times and places that wonderful hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Amen. You may be seated. And as the hymn suggests, sometimes God is, we are not able to see God, God shrouded in darkness of human vision, and so we know that we are often limited in our ability to see and to trust, and so we come before God at this time uh, to praise God, but also to confess our limitations. Let us pray. Lord God and loving Father, we know you seek both the young and the old, the convicted and the doubters, those bent in despair and those who are filled with joy. In all our various conditions, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless us in our worship today, O God. Bless us in words and bless us in music with tears and with laughter. Open the hearts of us who worship you all over the world, those who are online, those who have gathered here, and open our ears that we may hear your word and be encouraged for the living of our days. And we confess that as the seemingly endless days of this pandemic continues, we hear rumors of war We see rising crime rates and rising prices. We are absorbed with the ways of the world. We acknowledge that many of us come to worship today disheartened, discouraged, disappointed, with no wind in our sails and no passion for life. So renew our spirits, O God, as only you can, and forgive our despair and have mercy upon us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, take comfort in the assurance that even those things that are hidden from memory or that lie too deep for words are not beyond God's redeeming love. Our God who knows and loves us completely, forgives, restores, and sets free. Let us receive the forgiving love of God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
I'm always thinking about what I love about the church. I love this music. It's so wonderful. I'll tell you what else I really love, that we have children and youth here. Because the church, I think, is really the only truly intergenerational institution in our society. It is the place where, where we all come together, all ages, at the same time, in the same place. And it, is, it just brings so much joy to my heart. And so we're grateful to have children and youth with us today, aren't we? Amen? Yes. So as we send them off, we need to be praying for our children, friends. We really do. I have grandchildren who are in elementary school, uh, middle school, uh, getting ready to go to high school, and I know what's going on. I hear what's going on. So we need to be praying for our children. So let's pray for them as they get ready to go to their various programs. Oh God, we lift up every child and youth here today. We know that they too have their own battle zones. Social media, videos, school hallways, recess, playgrounds. Lord, we ask that today that each child and youth here may be strengthened by learning your word and learning your ways and strengthened just by being present in this loving community, that they may be strong in you, protected by you, and blessed by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen indeed. We'll see you, kids. Everybody give them, you can give them a wave. It's okay. <laughs> right? Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Good morning to you online. Welcome. We are continuing our battle plan series, kids included. They just get to do it downstairs where it's fun. Because we're talking about despair today, you know? Woo! <laughs> we're now in week three of five in this series. If you've missed last fall's series, Gold is what it was called. If you've missed that, that actually really is the prelude to this. Or if you've missed any of this series, go back and find the UPPC app. That really is the best way on your device because it has a listen-only option. So like if you're a podcaster or you listen to radio, you cook, you drive, whatever, you can listen only. It's actually uh, really helpful. So the UPPC app is how to catch up. Several years ago, uh, when I lived in Belfast, Northern Ireland, my housemates and I all awoke one night to the sound of two loud bangs nearby, very nearby. One sounded like it was right beside me because it was. So that red circle around the window is where my, the head of my bed was, and the little red circle on the sidewalk is where one of the small explosives went off. So when I say beside me, I mean, you know, beside me. <clears throat> Later, when our house was on the TV news, we learned that two homemade handheld explosives had been thrown in the vicinity of our house, but no one, including the TV report, knew why. So my imagination anxiously began to play out more and more terrifying scenarios. We lived in a staunchly Protestant area in a community house run by a Catholic nun. So I thought, what if, my, what if my, uh, the neighbors are tired of having this Catholic in their neighborhood? What if they're tired of having all of us foreigners in their neighborhood? They don't know us. We're strangers. What if next time they hurt one of us? I, I worried that it was personal. The emotions quickly grew from being startled to all-out fear, and my discouragement led to doubt, and I was tempted to give up. Of the eight demons confronted by our fourth century friend, Evagrius, I meant to pull this up last time. This is the book. The translation of Evagrius's battle plans against the, against the eight demons. We've covered three so far. Anger, gluttony, and lust. And all of those have connotations of action. A person is tempted to do something with those feelings. To lash out. To overindulge. To be sexually impulsive. But this week's tempting powers were another different kind of camouflage. Rather than tempting us to do wrong, I think they more often tempt us to... Stop doing anything to give up. Evagrius calls these two powers sadness and listlessness. That's how they're listed in the book. Sadness and listlessness. Now, of course, there is 
healthy sadness. I never want to take for granted that everyone remembers everything we've ever said. Because, you know. Um, But over the years, we have taught and we have preached from this pulpit at length about healthy, good sadness. Healthy grief, empathy, compassion. One of our core values, you can see at the bottom of your bulletin, is that we embrace messiness. We know the shortest verse in the Bible. Two words. Jesus wept. So sadness surprised me when I saw it on Evagrius' list. But it includes several other feelings. So as I read the chapter, I saw way more feelings involved, including fear, like what I experienced in Belfast, hopelessness, pessimism, discouragement, worthlessness, weakness, guilt, emptiness, loneliness. Much more than just sadness. So after a couple hours in thesauri, thesauri, thesauruses. After a couple hours looking for synonyms, I found a word that I'll use for the battle plan today. The battle plan today is to talk back to despair. Despair. Using scripture always and faith or what Paul calls in Ephesians 6 the shield of faith. You can find today's scripture in Psalm 27 if you have your own Bible with you right around the middle of your Bible. We'll get into that in a minute. First, what is despair? The dictionary defines despair as the feeling of no longer having any hope or confidence or extreme sadness, there's the word, or worry. All four of those in the dictionary's definition of despair. Now, I'm going to make a quick note, really a disclaimer, so I need to make sure everybody hears me, okay? The last two years of the pandemic and its congruent social tensions have created a mental health crisis in our country. That's the data. So it is essential that anyone hearing this message especially, but anyone always, seek professional help for your mental wellness. Nothing I say up here today should be taken as professional mental health advice. Okay? Okay? That's important. That's important, because what I fear is that somebody walks away going, Pastor Mike said I didn't need to see a psychologist because all I have to do is pray. Well, we believe in prayer and the power of prayer, but I'm not saying you should not see professional mental health uh, uh, advice if you need it. Pastor Aaron and I are big believers in good therapy. We are recipients of therapy. Now, I don't know if you uh, don't know where to begin. If you find yourself hearing this going, yeah, I know I need it. I have no idea where to go. The easiest way is to call 211. 211. I didn't even know about that until I learned about it in a mental health first aid class that I took right here at UPPC. 211. Calls are confidential. They'll point you in the right direction. Of course, you can always talk to us, your doctors, your insurance people, and the rest. Okay? We good? All right, let's proceed then with that understood. Outside of diagnosable conditions, we all face emotional distress at times. We read in scripture about, I think, all of the feelings that I listed earlier, which I'm summarizing with the word despair. So it's crucial to remember that feelings of despair, which are inevitable in human life, if you live long enough, those feelings are not sinful. Okay? The feelings of despair are not sinful. Jesus himself felt great anguish. At times, we're going to see some more examples from the Psalms as well. But despair can open the door to powers that oppose God's love and God's goodness. That is where the spiritual battle is waged. Not just against the emotion, but against what the emotion has the potential to do to us in terms of God. Despair can tempt us to abandon God because it seems that God has abandoned us. And there is no greater time for despair and the enemy's power behind despair to latch on to us with this exact temptation than during a crisis. In Belfast that night, I wasn't sinning when I felt afraid for our safety. But that fear could have easily transformed into doubting God's character, doubting God's protection, doubting whether or not this stubborn neighborhood I lived in was ever going to change. Right? Doubting whether or not I made a massive mistake in going there and the rest, right? Ultimately being in despair and tempted to quit. Let me ask you a question. 
I can't know this for sure. But if you were the enemy of God, and there was a house full of people who believe in God and Jesus and work in ministry in Jesus' name to bring peace and reconciliation to a divided city like Belfast, what would you want for that house? Wouldn't you want them to stop? I would. Doesn't it stand to reason that that kind of temptation would come upon people who were doing that kind of work? By the way, I said this last week too, if you believe in Jesus, I'm sorry to tell you, you said yes to the battle too. You become a threat to the one who hates God and hates Jesus and wants the world to hate Jesus too. So despair is an effective tool that makes people want to give up. So if our battle plan is to talk back using Scripture and faith, let's get to Scripture. We're looking at Psalm 27. We're going to look at it in three parts. Part one, we're going to learn to talk back to despair by proclaiming. Talk back to despair by by proclaiming. In fact, let's proclaim together just this one section. I'll read the rest myself. But on screen, you'll see the Scripture, uh, Psalm 27, verses 1 and 3. Let's read it together. Read it out loud. Let's proclaim. Ready? Let's go. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. This psalm is credited to David, who was very familiar with despair. Listen to a few examples from other psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. I'm overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. Psalm 88. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? Psalm 6. David knew the destructiveness of his own sin. He knew heartbreak. He knew betrayal of his own son. He knew the feeling of being surrounded by mortal enemies. More than most of us, I would think. So what makes the Psalms remarkable is not their declaration of victory after the battle is won. What makes them remarkable is their proclamation of truth in the midst of the battle itself. Think of the most famous Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack anything, even though I walk, present tense, through the darkest valley. You prepare a table for me in the midst of my enemies. That's all in Psalm 23. David proclaimed what he knew to be true even before his circumstances had improved. That's key. Only three days ago, I was on the phone with a new friend named Janice Liggins. There's Janice. And we were talking about her upcoming spot as my guest on the podcast Bible Jazz. Okay. Now Janice, not knowing that I was going to be talking about this today, Janice shared this with me and she gave me permission to share it with you. Janice shared that that morning, Thursday morning, in spite of having spent time in Scripture and in prayer, she was feeling, in her words, solemn and like she was in the doldrums. You guys know the doldrums? Heard that word? Well, the doldrums is actually a metaphor from sailing and refers to sailing ships getting stuck in the ocean because of a lack of wind. That's the doldrums. Literally having the wind taken out of your sails. The doldrums is the feeling of having no power. Power, Powerlessness is despair's playground. I won't ask for a show of hands who's felt any degree of powerless over the last two years. Right? It is despair's fertile soil. But even then, Janice, God bless her, She suddenly, she told me she suddenly remembered that while she may feel powerless, God is not. And before she felt better, she chose to make this proclamation out loud. I'm quoting from her book. Quote, I am a child of the Most High God, heir to the throne of grace, sibling to my Savior. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Thank you, Lord, that you bless whatsoever I set my hands to do in the name of Jesus. She told me that immediately her sense of the doldrums relented. She felt new energy 
And she was able to move forward in her day. That was 20 minutes before I called her. If you have eyes to see, then see. This is what spiritual battle looks like on a daily basis. Here's what matters most as you think of applying this first principle. This is huge, huge, huge. Pro- proclamation precedes feelings. Proclamation precedes feelings. That's what makes it so hard. That's what makes it a battle. Throughout Scripture, though, that's the order of things. The prophets, the apostles, even Jesus himself spoke the truth before his circumstances had changed and he could feel the truth. And feeling doesn't always come quickly. It did for Janice on Thursday morning. Praise God for that. But it doesn't always. Sometimes we make the proclamation and then we have to wait. And if we aren't ready to wait, that proclamation actually leads to disappointment and actually feeds that cycle of despair. See, I made a proclamation that God was good and two hours later I didn't feel better, so now I'm back in despair again. Beware, beware of that, that tendency. An author of a devotional I've been reading, Chris Tigreen, wrote this. I love this. Wait expectantly and expect to wait. <laughs> Proclaiming the truth of God's goodness may still lead to waiting, but waiting doesn't have to happen alone. So we move on to part two. What did David do next in Psalm 27 while well, he talked back to despair? We learn to talk back to despair by dwelling, by dwelling with the Lord. Verse 4, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Let's talk for a moment about why dwelling with God is not passive. I had a professor one time say, when he worked in a church office, he always worried if people saw him doing nothing in the office. Because in America, we don't like, and in North America, we don't like to be seen as inactive. So dwelling with God, uh, I got work to do, right? But let's talk about why dwelling with God is not actually passive. When we're confronted with the doldrums of despair, the temptation is to become inactive, ineffective. We've talked about that. So it seems natural that the, the antidote is to be active, right? Get busy. Problem is, too often we climb up on the mast and go thinking that that is what it takes, but it isn't. There's a great difference between being busy and being a busy body. Being busy with purposeful activities can absolutely increase our joy. It's good advice if you're in the doldrums to get doing something that can increase your joy, yes. Especially if you know your limits and you know when to take a rest, when you know when to stop, and you know when to say no. But being a busy body often makes us hasty, inefficient. We say yes to too much. We're wasteful with our time. We become scatterbrained, frenzied. While at the same time, boasting to all our friends about how busy we are. And it is a boast when we do that. Okay? But being a busybody, get this, it doesn't talk back to anything. Being a busybody doesn't talk back to despair. It runs from it. It runs from it. In this psalm, David talks back to despair with a bold proclamation of truth, but his next step is not to get busy fighting battles, solving problems, being a king. His next step was to enjoy. Enjoy the truth that he just said by dwelling in that truth. If God is my light, then bask in the light for a moment. It's okay. It's not passive. It's not lazy. It's part of the battle. Saying that God is my light and my salvation is like saying, look, there's a big powerful engine. But dwelling with God is like putting fuel into the engine. Making room to be with God in the midst of our challenges is like how children need to be with adults that they trust when uh, they face challenges. I was watching a kid's soccer game once with some friends and a boy fell on his wrist and he came sprinting to the sidelines holding his wrist. And the coach took a look at his wrist, you know, And then he grabbed a bucket filled with some kind of liquid and a sponge. And he dipped the sponge in there and he rubbed the boy's wrist like this. And he, you know, stuff's dripping everywhere. And he says, does that feel better? The boy said, not really. 
So he said, hang on a second, got to give you two doses. And he went in again, and he went like this. And, Does that feel better? The boy says, yeah, it feels, feels better. And he went back in the game, he played the rest of the game. So I said to my friend, what's in the bucket? And he said, water. We call this the magic sponge. The point is, sometimes all we really need is to pause the scary moment and go hang out with somebody who isn't scared. Ah, I I keep going off script, sorry. (laughs) I'm getting inspired. (laughs) Daryl Johnson, I've said this before, but it's too good of an image. Daryl Johnson, a professor of mine at Regent, said this about the book of Revelation. In the entire book, uh, God is introduced as the one seated on the throne. And in the entire book, in all of its chaos, you know what God never does? Stand up. Shake a fist. Point a finger. Why not? Because he need not. So if you want to know what power looks like, look to the one who is not afraid, not panicked, not bolting upright at night. And be with that person. Jesus slept in the bow of the boat when the boat was about to sink. Why? Because he need not be afraid. And he is the same Jesus now for you and me. And all we have to do is have the courage to put our busyness aside for three seconds and just dwell with him and forgive ourselves for being human. Okay? I'm way off script now. This uh, dwelling with God is sometimes called contemplative prayer. Henry Nouwen, a favorite around here, wrote this about contemplation. We can keep ourselves from being pulled from one urgent issue to another, from becoming strangers to our own heart and God's heart. Contemplative prayer deepens in us the knowledge that we are already free, that we have already found a place to dwell that we already belong to God, even though everything and everyone around us keeps suggesting the opposite. That's what it looks like to battle despair by dwelling with God. There are books and, and videos and personal coaches who can, who can get you into this habit. A tool that I've started to use recently is a mobile device app, actually, called Centering Prayer. The icon looks like that. Using scripture, it guides you through simply being with God for one minute or three minutes. It doesn't take much to make a marked difference in your day and in your life. So despair tempts us to abandon God because it makes it look like God has abandoned us. But we talk back by proclaiming the truth, even if we don't feel it yet, by dwelling with God and gazing on his beauty through things like the song that we heard. That's a great way to dwell, by the way, in music. And finally, our third part, we talk back to despair by asking. We talk back to despair by asking for what we need. David said, hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think it's safe to say that for many people, whether they're religious or not, asking God for things is actually a pretty automatic response to a great need. Like, right? Like when you're in high school before a big test, like, please, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord. Right? It's sort of an automatic. People do it. When the heaviness of despair can prompt a reaction in us that's similar to physical pain or immediate danger, it prompts us to ask for help. So that, that comes naturally. And David faced a lot of oppression, false witnesses, malicious accusers, deadly uh, enemies. He's certainly asking for God's help here. But his asking, his asking is a noteworthy change from the proclamation and the dwelling that we just talked about. One commentator actually calls this change to asking sudden and anxious, like it's out of place. But I, I disagree with that. Uh, David's plea for God's help actually arises directly as the result of his proclamation and of his dwelling with God. His asking God now is not anxious. It is confident, just as the rest of the psalm. 
is confident. Asking God for something doesn't denote a lack of confidence. It's the opposite. When we ask, especially when we ask for bold things, we are expressing faith and confidence that God is able, that God is able. This orientation can utterly transform what we ask for and how we ask. One time, uh, a man had a son, and this, this boy was suffering specifically from seizures and from self-harm, like burning himself. I know that's kind of hard to hear. Now, the man knew some people who claimed to follow Jesus, so he went to them, and, and uh, he asked for their help. They tried to help the boy, and they couldn't. didn't work. If that sounds familiar, it's because that story appears in three of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story. When Jesus heard about this, he healed the boy and he, his followers asked why they had failed. And he replied, because you have so little faith. <laughs> Thanks, Jesus, for being so honest. Truly, I tell you, he said, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move nothing would be impossible. Hmm. The temptation to despair can happen at any time, including in the middle of our prayers. If you have ever found yourself asking God for something in prayer and simultaneously doubting that it was going to happen, then you know what I'm talking about. Okay? Despair tempts us to see the size of the mountain instead of the size of God, which is what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about muscling up and having super faith. He's talking about keeping your focus on the one you have faith in. That is what moves mountains, not, not your prayer. Author Chris Tigreen again wrote, We feel instinctively impoverished when we pray and nothing happens. Amen? Amen. If you've ever prayed, if, you haven't, if you've never had that experience, you need to pray more. You will. Sorry to be discouraging, but like join the club, right? <laughs> he writes, a downward cycle of unbelief can begin, weakening our expectations, undermining our faith until our prayers become little more than faint hopes. He is describing exactly what despair can do to us. It starts as an emotion, it becomes spiritually damaging. He continues, beware of limiting your prayers to whatever seems realistic. The size of the mountain is never an issue. From God's point of view, even Mount Everest is just a bump on a map. So as we get ready to close, I invite you to participate with me. I hope you brought your armor. This is battle time. I know. I didn't ask your permission. I'm sorry. But we're going to do a little battle right now. And uh, I'm going to tell you right on the outset, you don't have to say anything out loud. You don't have to turn to your neighbor or any of that kind of stuff, okay? This is private for you, but I'm going to invite you to be as active as you can or as you're willing to be in this. First, I'm going to ask you to take a moment to think of something or someone in your life or your world or your awareness which you care about, but which you know that you are ultimately powerless to change, okay? It's not that you are altogether all powerless, but that ultimately you're powerless to change, okay? Close your eyes if you have to, to gain some focus. Maybe open your mind to the voice of God in your heart. And just think, what's the big ask in your world right now? Maybe it's something you've hesitated to pray about because it seems too big. Maybe it's something you've hesitated to pray about because you already have and nothing's happened. If you don't have anything in mind yet, that's okay. Stay open. Maybe something will come to mind. But if you do, here we go. I'm going to pray out loud and invite you to follow my prompts as you pray along with me uh, quietly. Let's practice David's example in Psalm 27 right here and right now. Let's do some battle. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit into this place and space where we know you always exist but you don't impose. You do wait until we invite you in. 
You stand at the door and knock. You do not break the door down. So we open the door to your spirit to come into our hearts and our minds. Living God, our experience of life can leave us downcast, afraid, listless, sad, and we're tempted to despair. So right now, we make time to proclaim the truth of your goodness using your word as your sword in Psalm 27. The Lord is our light and our salvation. We need not fear. You are our stronghold and our life. We will stand in the face of opposition. Even though war may break out against us, we will be confident. This is the truth that you've given us, and we proclaim it boldly and without fear and without hesitation and without embarrassment. And having made that proclamation, we make time to dwell with you in this moment without hurry or agenda. To gaze upon your beauty, as David says in Psalm 27. To consider the sounds of your melodies. To see the beauty of a new day. To remember the blessings you've bestowed upon us. And we rejoice at how faithful you have been. And though it can feel risky to ask for things that seem as unlikely as mountains moving, we strive to have the faith of Jesus. So in this moment, despite the sense of risk, we take a step in faith, betting not on our own wisdom or on the eloquence of our own words, but we bet on your power and your grace. So in this quiet moment, will you hear this thing, this big ask, this mountain uh, that all of these people are asking for? Hear our prayers. We choose to wait expectantly, and we expect to wait. We wait in faith, just like you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Despair and all that it entails is not new. Many people are struggling with it more acutely right now than usual, perhaps. But God is still good, still in charge. We still proclaim that truth even before we feel it. We dwell in God's presence and we ask even for the unlikeliest thing. This is our battle plan against despair. And we go to battle in Jesus' name. Amen.
But Mike uh, puts a wind in my sails. Uh, I'll tell you what it is. Giving to the church. Giving to others and giving to the church. It's a concrete action uh, that strengthens my faith. And today, I don't want to emphasize the church's need to receive our offerings. I want to emphasize what giving can do for your heart. What giving can do for your heart. Because you see, giving is concrete action that nourishes joyful conviction. Giving is concrete action that nourishes joyful conviction. And so I just want to encourage you to give, uh, particularly if you're feeling some of these feelings of despair, and give because it will, it will be one factor that heals your heart. And you can give right outside in the narthex. There's a basket out there. You can mail in a check. You can give online at uppc.org and, and just click on give and do it. And I know that you will feel better. sure if I'm on. We've prayed, we've listened to the word, we've confessed, and, um, and we've spent some time in silence. Right now, we're going to praise. We're just going to praise God. Many of you know this, praise his holy name, sing to the Lord um, his praises. If you know it, sing along, enjoy. If you want to raise your hand, if you want to move your body or tap your foot a little bit, just have some fun. When we were practicing this morning out in the hallway, um, some people were just moving around and, and uh, just feeling the presence of God. And so whatever, whatever that looks like for you, just join us as, as you will or as you choose. Let's stand. Here we go.
Oh, man, I saw all the demons of despair go right out the doors. Right then, they're gone, aren't they? Aren't they? Yes. Woo! Yeah. It's been an especially eventful week in the news. The siege of Beth Israel in Texas, the synagogue, rising violence in our cities, especially in New York, and the impact, the continuing impact on COVID and especially its impact on the church. Uh, during this time, many of us long for the days when we can be out in the community doing active mission and outreach. But in these quieter and more secluded days, may we remember in the words of A.W. Tozer that God wants worshipers before workers. And the workers God seeks are those who have learned the lost art of worship. And we also want to remember that uh, we always have the ministry of those who are near, our neighbors, our friends in church, our families. Our hearts will be filled with neighbor love. Jesus promises that. If you receive the weekly email from our church, you may have seen the header, Meet the Pastors and Renew Your Marriage. <laughs> now, wouldn't it just be great if just by meeting and talking to the pastors, you'd have an instant marital re renewal? But that's not what that is trying to communicate. These are two separate events, my friends. <laughs> They're independent of each other, and today at 1215, we have Meet the Pastors. Uh, uh, we invite anybody who's new to our community today to come and be with us to learn a little bit more about our community, our congregation. Come to the Wayside for a uh, specially prepared beverage of your choice and learn more about its, our church and its mission. And then beginning on on, in February, on Tuesday nights, we'll be having what I think is one of the most interesting marriage renewal in-person experiences taught by Pastor Aaron, myself, Pastor Greg Chandler and his wife Jane, and Dr. Amanda Wood, who is a psychologist. And, and it is going to be terrific, really, no matter how long or how short you've been married. This is really worth your time and effort. And there is child care being offered as well. I often tell people that the church is the only institution in this country that cares about your marriage, that cares about marriage and your marriage. And we know that especially during this difficult time that marriage renewal is more important than ever. So go to UPP uppc.org and look under events, and I invite all of you to register. Uh, today, we're going to do a bidding prayer, and so when you hear me say, Lord, in your mercy, I'm going to ask you to say, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray. O shepherd of our souls, we come to you with thanksgiving for the provision of your word, a light on our path, a shield for battling the forces that act upon us every day. Help us to return home to your word every day, and may we say with the psalmist, Lord, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? Come upon us powerfully today, O God, and strengthen us. O Lord, in your mercy, we grieve the invasion of places of worship and ask, Oh, how long, O Lord? We lament violence in all of its forms and pray for the well-being of our cities. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we sit on the edge of possible war in the Ukraine, give us confidence that you are for us and not against us, and help us remember what Janice proclaimed, that no weapons before us shall in the end prevail. 
But may we also hold fast to the dream of the day when the sword shall be beaten into plowshares and war shall be no more. We pray for peace, Lord, fervently and with hope. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we, some of us are weary. We're we're weary of the desert and destruction of COVID. We pray for your healing hands to be on our full hospitals and and especially on those weary health care providers. We need the oasis of your promises and our faith. Our spirits lag from unanswered prayer. Lord, give us the capacity to wait expectantly, trusting that you know what we need more than we do. And as we dwell in your house, may we be actively persistent in prayer and pray the prayer that your Son Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we deliver our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen ask you to stand. We're going to sing verses verse 1 and 4 of Love Divine. Amen. Well, friends, I want to bless you with David's last words in Psalm 27. Seems appropriate. I'm going to just change the wording a little to make it into a blessing. May you, in the name of Jesus, remain confident of this, that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart and wait for the Lord. We will do that in faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people say together, amen. Go in peace.